Good morning, everybody. I'd particularly like to uh, welcome back the people who had a midterm or a paper <laughs> last week. I have a very restorative attitude towards that kind of thing. It's definitely not, hey, get out of here, you missed class. But uh, come back in. I do, I do know that there are other courses uh, going on that in some cases you have to take them, uh, regrettable as that is. A uh, little announcement, uh, yesterday was the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, 1965. That was the day that the Montgomery to Selma March took place and it uh, was a good example of how the paradox of repression works. These marchers were very, very brutally clubbed and badly dealt with when they got to the other side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And so the next Sunday the whole country basically was there with a lot of religious authorities and people like that. It was kind of a climax of the civil rights movement. Well, huh? John Edwards is using that march as part of his campaign. Who? Edwards? Yeah. You know, there's actually some pretty good candidates out there. I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I remember one campaign where one famous commentator said if the Lord had wanted us to vote, he would have given us candidates. <laughs> and now there actually are a few. Those of you who were at my uh, little conversation with the Jesuits on Thursday, I'd like to hear what, how it seemed to you. I, I have, yeah, just, and you don't have to make nice. I just you know, tell me straight up. Um, I also wanted to announce that there's a handbook called the Handbook of Peace and Conflict Studies. And I think this year's edition is going to be very, very good because it's co-edited by a fellow who's been doing them all along and Johann Galton. And he's, you know, about one of the best that we've got. So Wabel and Galton, Handbook of Peace and Conflict Studies is just hitting the stands. Um, we, on Tuesday, of course, we're going to basically have a review for the midterm. And what I often do for those is nothing. There's I just come in and say, okay, here I am. What's on your mind? What, uh, what do you like? What didn't you like? What do you not understand? What I think I'd like to do this time is take half an hour for a presentation by one of the people who's involved in the tree sit that's going on right now, the Oak, Oak Satyagraha. Uh, there's a famous elderly tree sitting woman, I understand, in Redwood Mary. <laughs> and uh, one of my students is going to try and get a hold of her and have her come and talk to us. So I think that probably will substitute in inspiration and immediacy of contact what we otherwise would have gotten by the extra 30 minutes of going over the terms and so forth. So if, if that sounds okay to you, then what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit more about restorative justice, if you don't mind, and then just a little bit about animal rights and then start talking about environmental struggles and put the spotlight on India and do the same thing that I did with the uh, European anti-militarism, which is to look at one of those middle era campaigns that took place in between Gandhi and the modern age. So we have kind of a sense of that historical continuity. And the issue will be, uh, the, the organization, the movement will be the Chipko or Hugging Movement. So am I going to cover all of this? I have no idea, but it's okay. I think uh, some of you were expressing to me that we are, there is a lot that we're not getting to. But my main concern, I think the most useful thing that we can do is have a frame of reference in which to understand all of this stuff. And if we can accomplish that, then you can go out and learn the stuff and, and pick up on what's going on on your own. Of course, you can't have a frame of reference without any content. So that's why I, and I do think it's inherently good to know our history, who's done what, and learn from that history what has gone wrong and so forth. I was actually looking over the weekend at the uh, research report that Christine Schweitzer and other people had done for the Nonviolent Peace Force. And I really do feel that that's a significant contribution to the advancement of peace. Just to know the history and to be able to sift out from that history what works in what circumstances and what does not 
it's uh, really a very valuable document. And I think I emailed you a link, didn't I? So you can go right to that in the Nonviolent Peace Force page. All right. So given that I can't possibly cover anything, everything I mean, but <laughs> I can cover some things. <laughs> oh, another Freudian slip. Um, I can't possibly cover everything that I even wanted to. So why not? we're not even going to try. <laughs> Any questions that are left over from last time? that you'd like us to go into before I start. Yes, RB. From that one time you're talking about making step four, step number one. Yeah. Um, I kind of saw like a parallel with the sword of justice. Like should that be compared to the step four that you want? In a sense it could. I mean I hope you understand Arby's question. It was coming off that four stage list that was presented by the Gene Sharp community in that film uh, Where There Is Hatred. It has different titles, but we saw the one called Where There Is Hatred. And step four was after the revolution – we have a seat right here, Safety, if you want. Okay. After the revolution, you go and restore society, build it back up, and create the world that you want. Gandhi had said a long time ago, that will never happen. Uh, if you – I'm, I'm going to be – you know, taking a big philosophical overview, if you go for the negative first, you will not get around to the positive. The thing is to get to the positive first and then let the negative kind of shatter itself against you. So, and I think we have seen this and will continue to see it in campaign after campaign, especially the insurrectionary ones, that um, if you try to simply overthrow a regime and say that then you're going to rebuild a new world, it doesn't happen. You have to try to rebuild a new world and the regime will get in your way and say, hey, we don't want this. Then you have your nonviolent moment and then it works. So Arby's question, how does restorative justice figure in? That's interesting because I did say last time that I would characterize the current state of the movement as scattered constructive program with very little obstructive program. So in a sense, Yes, but in a sense – and I've made this very clear in my book. I think it's chapter six that's on this stuff. In a sense, even restorative justice is after the fact and not enough because you're waiting until somebody has committed an act against the general welfare and then you're saying, okay, you've identified yourself as a miscreant. How do we get you back in? But by itself, that wouldn't really be the heart and soul of constructive program. By itself – and you, I don't know if you've seen – if you remember the Wheel of Nonviolence that's on in the book? If you look at crime as a problem, the Gandhian answer to this was education. And because I guess what we're saying is that commit a crime against f your fellow human beings is a form of ignorance. It's a failure to understand that to hurt another person, you're hurting yourself, which we now have some scientific evidence for. In a way, I kind of regret it, you know, because who needed scientific evidence? If you don't have the imagination to see this, uh, dot, 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 I don't know. But okay, never mind my petty little complaints. But it, it certainly to hurt another person and think that you're benefiting yourself from that is a form of ignorance and the appropriate way to address it is preventatively through education. It's interesting that you can also use education after the crime has been committed and it works very well in that category also. I was just talking with Mansura who works with us um, in Meta and she was just hearing a program about uh, – well, I guess there's a fellow who attacked a, a LS – sorry, gay, lesbian L, – LG, thank you – LGBT house here in Berkeley. Uh, and he fortunately didn't hurt anyone and he was uh, – the judge sentenced him to an anger management class, which if it works is a very deep form of re-education. So we were sitting there sipping chai, watching the crows on the FSM uh, area there. Didn't see you there today. <laughs> and uh, asking ourselves, is this restorative justice or retributive justice? And we came to the conclusion that it's kind of a mixed bag. It's definitely restorative to say to somebody, you have a problem with your anger, you need to control it. 
but it's retributive to say you have to do that. We are sentencing you to this. The best way, if you could possibly do it, was to bring a person to the point where they say, ooh, I have a little problem with anger, don't I? I wonder if you can help me with that. Which, if you remember, the letter that I was reading you last time, and I, I wasn't even reading you the most heartbreaking parts of many letters that I've gotten from this fellow in, uh, in this high security prison in Florida. This does happen to people. They wake up and they say, whoa, I've gotten myself in trouble. I need to get out of it. And then in the case of most people, like that friend of mine in Florida, there's no way that we have no facilities to help that person. Okay. Lengthy answer to a <laughs> reasonable question. But. So, okay, so one of the reasons I realized just over the weekend was a very exciting creative weekend for me. I realized that one of the reasons that I like restorative, restributive, restorative, and I like it so well that I can spell the terms in this case, I actually think that this is the, one of the very rare cases where we got to make up the vocabulary. You know, there's a few others. Like we call ourselves progressives. The rest of the world does not. They call us uh, avocado eaters, <laughs> body piercing New York Times reading liberals, things like that. But at least in our own discourse community, we made up a term for ourselves that works much better. And obviously, people outside the community don't like it because I had one of them say to me one time, so if you're a progressive, what does that say about the rest of us? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a little bit like that with this set of terms too. Now, they did not – they don't say that they're retributive. They talk about the difference between rehabilitation, which I feel is a very weak form of restorative, versus punishment. And you may be aware that California, which had a fairly progressive – there, I've used that word again, and I, I'm glad I did. Progre California had a fairly progressive criminal justice approach in which it was mostly oriented around rehabilitation. And in 1976, there was a statewide decision that from now on the purpose of the criminal justice department of the state of California will be punishment. I just went in for that. Um, but restorative is a much more positive term. It brings about the notion, the image that there's something there to restore. The person had something, they lost it, and it can be restored. Before I talk more about the term, which I'm going to do in just a little bit, I wanted to point out one of the connections between the criminal justice area and other areas of violence or nonviolence. I was very, very saddened when uh, the Holocaust Museum was about to open in Washington. I was saddened that they even opened the thing because I think this is the wrong way to go about memorializing and restoring. But anyway, okay, that's, that's another issue. But when it was about to open, the German government said, could we also put a museum next to that which would be a museum of modern Germany? And you can see what Germany is doing now since that dreadful era, which was as dreadful for us as it was for you. And immediately that permission was denied. Now that really shocked and irritated me. Fortunately, I conquered anger, so <laughs> that joke. <laughs> but I think this was like a huge mistake. This is like blocking the door to restoration, to rehabilitation. Uh, it, it infuriated – well, of course it couldn't have. But <laughs> what particularly got me was, you know, I had spent a fair amount of time in Germany and I felt that uh, there were so many good things going on in that country and they were really coming off that era in a beautiful way and it could be a lesson for all of us. But no, we have to have this attitude that restoration is not possible. So that shows you the connection between what we do domestically and what we do internationally. There's even a connection – we're going to be talking about animal rights in a little bit. 
and one of the early uh, English philosophers on animal rights said that if we are cruel to animals, we will be unjust to one another as well. That's the importance of it. So whether you believe that animals have souls or not, even if you don't go there, uh, and, and we will be going there in a minute, but even if you don't go there, if you allow people to practice cruelty to animals, they'll practice cruelty to one another. It's not a coincidence that the CIA maintains hunting lodges where people can go out and kill animals and discuss for their next move. Yeah, Matthias? Yeah. Yeah. It's – yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same energy from our dynamic standpoint. It's the same action whether you hurt an animal or a person. And I get, guess what, folks? A person is an animal, but just an animal with a PhD. <laughs> uh, and I suppose this gets us back to uh, our – the hero of the Uppor movie and saying, you know, we were for life, they were against it, and that's why we won and they lost. So Johann Galtung's definition of violence is anything that inhibits the fulfillment of life. Um, actually, that isn't his definition. It's my version of his definition. But I'll talk it over with Johann next time he's out here. I have a special role in his life. I help him out with Greek and Latin terms whenever he needs them. You know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> back to the point. Now, of course, there were specific political reasons why they didn't want that uh, alternative mu complementary museum built. And that's because in order to keep on carrying out the uh, aggressive foreign policy that we have, we as a nation have, we have to be able to construe it to put it in a framework of redemptive violence. And the conspicuous act of redemptive violence in our national history recently was the liberation of Europe uh, at the end of World War II. And that's why uh, there was a president who has the same name as this president, but he's, he was a little bit earlier. He was actually the father of this president. Okay. Uh, in 1991, when the, we were starting to bomb Iraq, he got on the radio and said in a voice where you know, I almost never listen to these guys, but I happened to catch him saying this as riding in a van. He literally was trying to sound like Eisenhower. He literally was kind of uh, imitating, per impersonating Eisenhower. And he said, the liberation of Kuwait has begun. As though uh, Iraq was going to take over the world and convert us all into some terrible totalitarian thing and they were liberating us. And uh, I, I can see you smirking. I agree with you. This is ridiculous. But the fact is this is the way people think. And I don't think that's the word we want. This is the kind of knee-jerk reaction that people have. A part of them wants to be violent. A part of them needs uh, an acceptable moral framework in which to put that violence. So we have to keep on reliving World War II because we say to ourselves, that World War II was the good war. Remember that film, The Good War, and those who refused to fight it. Actually, it wasn't such a good war. And we didn't fight it for the right reasons. But I don't want to get into that whole thing, but I'll tell you what books to read <laughs> later on if you're interested in really getting demoralized. So what am I saying? That there were specific reasons why we have to maintain this mythos, this mythology that uh, w in fighting that particular war, we were fighting against evil and all other wars that we fight are the same as that war. It's, it's ridiculous when you bring it out in the open. So what's the solution? Don't bring it out in the open. Just keep using the images and the frames and let people react. So, but okay, even if you take away that particular political reason, there is an underlying reason and that is that we do not believe as a culture at this point in time, we do not believe in restoration. We do not believe in the regenerability of the human being. And actually, in theological terms, we are a, a deeply 
pagan nation. We, are, we do not fit in the Judeo-Christian framework in terms of our the real controlling processes that some of you are studying in a complementary course to this one. So this is all a rather long-winded – obviously I needed to get something off my chest. Thank you. I feel a lot better now. <laughs> but what I'm trying to show is that as Matthias was pointing out, these things all go together. If you can bring yourself into a frame of mind in which it feels acceptable to you to commit cruelty against any form of life, it will spill over into other forms of life. It's just the basic dynamic there is the same. Hence the importance of restorative justice as a constructive program which is rather unconfrontational. You know, it does not – what I like are stealth programs which are going to overthrow the entire paradigm but they don't know it. That's my, my model here is the spinning campaign. Or if you, if you remember the Gandhi film, I, I showed a piece of the Gandhi film in a two-day course. It was the one where uh, the, the British Viceroy was talking about the salt march and he says, it's going to take more than a pinch of salt to bring down the British Empire. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought I'd miss my calling, don't you? <laughs> uh, how wrong he was. You know? And that's the kind of campaign on one level that I like. On one level, I like transparency. It should be out in the open. But on another level, I think it's counterproductive to push people's buttons. And it's much more productive to create something positive which they will be attracted to and you have undercut them. So restorative justice, to repeat, goes right to the heart of the whole commitment to violence that runs through our culture. But it does it in a way that's uh, not provocative, at least not confrontational. It still isn't getting very far because if you want to lose a campaign as a politician in this country, the easiest way to do that uh, you know, sexual misconduct will only work under certain circumstances. That's a peculiarly American system there. But the one thing that will absolutely get you diselected faster than anything else is for you to be soft on crime. You know, or even if you're not soft on crime and they say you are and the timing is right, you will be absolutely crashed. So that shows you how deeply embedded in our value system this punitive arrangement is. Zoe. Yes. You know, Zoe is bringing up a very good point which uh, I touched on with the Jesuit friends. Uh, security. I mean, the latest thing that I wrote for Meta's blog was about security and the new concepts of security which are called they used to be called total security. Now it's called human security, I, I learned last week. But also an a, a complementary aspect is common security as opposed to what there is no real word for it, but we might call it separate security. Separate security stating, I'm going to keep you so terrified that you won't dare attack me. So you're insecure, I'm secure. The more insecure you are, the more secure I am, which you know we would not believe for – even two milliseconds. But common security says in order for me to be secure, you have, you have to be secure. If you're secure, you will have no reason to attack me. And yes, you're absolutely right. This, on one hand, it's the sense of retribution that we got even. And on the other hand, it's a false sense of security that we put the bad people away. Uh, who was it? Uh, one, one second, Matthias. Somebody – I think it was Solzhenitsyn or somebody like that said the line between good and evil runs through the heart of every human being. And the whole mistake is to think that it runs through the community in some way. So we could put the bad human beings here and the good human beings here, separate them out and we'll have paradise. But in that very act of separation, we're tearing paradise apart. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're either with us or against us. Yeah. Us and, yeah. And, and it works because people don't have to get into any concept. They don't have to 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Work for something they know mm-hmm. is stay open. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as you know, yeah. Wife, yeah. Either, you know, punishment or yeah. This uh, problem has often been brought up in the progressive community, namely one of the problems with the present regime it is the simplistic black and white polarizing thinking. And it's so then the next step in our own thinking is, well, if we get people to think about things in a subtler, more complex way, this th- would solve the problem. I'm mostly convinced of that, but part of me is so pessimistic that I think you have to get people to have a good knee-jerk reaction <laughs> instead of a bad knee-jerk reaction. And then we can get them to a sophisticated level. Um, I'm a little bit stuck on how you, how you said that society has tended to um, reject the notion of rehabilitation mm-hmm. as a whole. It seems that – I mean maybe it's from my limited experience, but it seems that um, on a smaller scale, like a, as in a family member, um, yeah. if, if a family member commits a crime – right. Right. And at some level, it does exist. And why yeah. is it that on the broader level we can reject it, but it's mm-hmm. still there on the individual? Okay. No. Yeah. Ashley's point is is really excellent, and I think there's I, there's two aspects to it. One, I'm being kind of simplistic when I make just sweeping generalizations like that, and it's been often pointed out to me that I do that, uh, but somehow it hasn't helped. I keep on doing it. I don't know why. He's partly trying to get through a lot of stuff and pull out the main things and have them be clear. I will often speak in exaggerated terms. And clearly it is the case that there are pockets within our society where restoration is the norm. And clearly you're right, Ashley, that tends to be the case in the family. And that's part of the point with restorative justice is that you try to rehumanize the process so people deal with one another more like family members. And any of these little charts that you've seen which kind of spell out, okay, here's restorative approach, here's the retributive approach, you'll see that the first thing that tends to come up is in the retributive approach, the crime belongs to the state. Whereas in the restorative approach, it belongs to the victim. And if they're really sensitive and sophisticated, they'll say, it belongs to the torn relationship between the victim and the offender. Hold on just one second. Now, one of the ways of looking at what the bad process that's going on here is that the values of the state are seeping down into the family rather than the family values of the family expanding up into the state. And I think the, the main mechanism for that is called television. Everybody sits around, watches a program that's been programmed by somebody far away whose sole purpose is to be popular. And unwittingly what's happening is the values of the abstract community are overwhelming the values of the human family. Uh, I I don't want to dwell on this because it's not a very happy topic, but just to give you one example that I think I have in my book. there was a divorce took place in San Francisco some years ago. Not in itself an uncommon occurrence, but uh, the ex-husband in this relationship was talking about how he's going through this legal process and, he, and said, I have to get something out of this relationship. You know, really looking at it as a business contract. And that's where like the formal – what is it? Gesellschaft versus Gemeinschaft. It's Gesellschaft values seeking down into the Gemeinschaft, into the human community. That's so obviously family values – there they go again. They've got our word. Family values are a way of restoring society if we would build it up from the nucleus instead of having it come crashing in from the externals. Yes. Lisa? Your name is – Sarah. Sarah, sorry. I didn't catch the last part. Uh, how much do you think that the way that you have developed like, so far is the uh, because of the whole idea that you need to figure it out and so on, which a lot of people think that's the 
Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, Sarah's question, I mean, I thought I was being philosophical, <laughs> is about – you called it planned obsolescence, but I think what you're really talking about is the second law of thermodynamics, that everything runs down over a time. <laughs> because I would – yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess because our economy depends on overconsumption in the sense that we have to consume more than we need, we have to change that value uh, of sustainability to one of obsolescence. That you know, you've got the latest model of blah blah, and it, you know, we're all susceptible to this. I had this cell phone, and I showed it to my granddaughter, and she laughed out loud, and. <laughs> I thought I had to go and buy myself a new one. You know, I was like totally not on time with that <laughs> stupid little Nokia. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not <laughs> offending anyone. Um, so now that I understand what generally you're talking about, Sarah, what? Uh, okay. About oh. You know, I don't think that I don't think that the planned obsolescence value would necessarily conflict with regenerability because, in the sense that I'm using it here, we have to have a belief that however violent, dehumanized a person has become, that there's a core of that person that has not been violated, and that that has to be touched, and we have to restore the person from that core. And when you say that core does not exist, this is basically the Manichaean heresy. You're basically s believing in the absolute existence of evil, basically. And the, what the, where the planned obsolescence piece would come in is that, you know, how often do you renew? And where does continuity balance with renewal? That, that would be a little bit different in each, in each case. Okay, this is terrific. So, let, yes, Michael. Uh, yeah, there's. Uh, this is. Uh, there was a. In the middle of the third century, there was a man in Persia. His name was Mani. I don't know why I keep. <laughs> I know you're not Persian, are you? But you're the closest I can come right here. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. There you go. So in that sense, I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, his Greek name was Manichaios, which we get Manichaean from. And he – this belief is fostered on him, though I don't – I'm not entirely sure he actually believed this. But anyway, the belief that the universe was an interplay of absolute good and absolute evil. And each of those had the same ontological – Reality, you know what I mean? It had the same degree of realness. They were both absolutely real, and so the world was going to be a continual fight between good and evil because evil could never be completely overcome. Now you compare this with Gandhi's outlook, and he makes a very a challenging statement that evil exists only insofar as we support it. If we could withdraw all our support from it, it would cease to exist. Whereas good can never cease to exist. That was his belief. Ein guter Mensch in seinem dunklen Dränge ist sich des rechten Weges wohl bewusst. A good person, and we're all good people, even if we get caught up in very dark uh, drives and behaviors, we know perfectly well what's going on, and that knowledge can be touched in the right way. We can be regenerated. Yeah. Arby. Okay. Good question. How does this uh, – non-belief in the absolute existence of evil 
how does that tie into the story that I repeat endlessly of the Native American grandfather with the two wolves fighting inside of him? Uh, I believe that that's true in practical terms on the individual level. I mean, that's – Manichaeism works not as an absolute description of reality but as a handy thumbnail version of what we have to do every day in our life. Because in practical terms, folks, and I'm sorry to have to add this, I don't think we have the capacity to completely withdraw our attention from evil. So Gandhi's thing remains hypothetical, mostly. However, is, are you following me? That's just clear. You know, I, I can withdraw my attention from evil partly, but then you know I'll walk past a billboard and off it'll go again. Or somebody who's running for office will annoy me, and and off it'll go again. So. It remains hypothetical but it's also very practical because in real terms in the phenomenal world that we live in, it's a matter of degree. And in that world, the more I withdraw my attention from – okay, I'm calling it evil. I think you know what I mean. Harm, destruction, lack of life. The more we withdraw our attention from that and put it on the good side, the stronger it will be. And it's not possible for a person – to completely eradicate his or her sense of reality, his or her goodness. But it is possible for a person to completely eradicate his or her evil. And I think we've come pretty close with people like Gandhi actually. It, it, very rare but it happens. So you know – remember Boulding's first law. Any of you who are peace studies majors should be aware of uh, Kenneth Boulding. And I'm really jealous of him and he has a law named after him. As you know, I've tried three or four times but they don't seem to stick. <laughs> so I'm depending on you people. <laughs> the Boulding's first law is that anything that has happened is possible. Okay. Yeah. Boulding's first law. Anything that has happened is possible. And the way I'm applying it right now is because we have had – a few human beings have just about in all practical terms eliminated the last vestige of selfishness within themselves. Uh, it shows that that's possible to happen. Now some people think, okay, it was okay for them because, you know, well, he was brown or he didn't have any hair or and no teeth or <laughs> something like that. But I think all of those things have got to be very superficial. You know, they, the, the other position is that if, it, if one person was able to do this, then theoretically any person can. Therefore, we ought to rebuild our culture on that basis and make it possible for the maximum number of people <laughs> to get the furthest ahead with this that they can. And what we've got now is like a classic image of the exact opposite. I mean, I just got a notice in the mail the other day from my car dealer. Yes, I own a car. I'm sorry. <laughs> at, at least it's a Prius. Okay. <laughs> so, so here's this advertisement from a Toyota dealer in Santa Rosa. And on the front cover in big, bold red letters, it's all about you. <laughs> it's not about fuel economy. It's not about saving the environment. It's not about having a safe car to drive in. It's about my little ego. That's going to make me run in there and have a f an oil change right this very week. Okay, I have a feeling I'm sort of a little bit out of control here today, <laughs> but it's, it's okay. Amy? Yes, Gandhi said I – in fact, he prefaced that by saying it is my absolute conviction that anyone can achieve what I have achieved if they cultivate the same determination and faith. Amy? Uh, the Shannon? <laughs> Yes. Yes. Isn't that interesting? When people do achieve this – and as I was saying to our Jesuit friends last week, the point of an avatar, somebody who reaches this 
pinnacle is not to fix the world but to show how the world could be fixed. And instead we do the exact opposite. And this was my attitude to Gandhi before I started having a spiritual practice of my own. I thought, well, boy, you know, that's terrific but I can't go there. Uh, you know, for one thing, this fasting, sorry, <laughs> I need my three squares a day. <laughs> that's, that's all there is to it. You arrest me, put me in prison and take away my food, I'll sign anything. Well, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious. But I just did not feel that that was what he did was humanly possible for me. And this is part of the belief that, there, that evil has an absolute existence and we can never totally overcome it is we take these people and say they weren't people. That's why this new film, Lage Raho Munabai, has been so successful because it de-deified Gandhi. It took him down off the pedestal. In fact, the first thing that Gandhi says in that movie was destroy every Gandhi statue in the world. That was part of the point of that film. Yeah. Amy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, well, just to, to repeat what Amy was saying, uh, just a second, Matthias. Uh, that um, the th good thing about Gandhi is that a he was close enough to us in time that he's well documented, and b he got to do his own documentation. Guess what? We never let people do that. You know, we tell their story for them. Uh, I wanted to – and then you want not to speak about the deification of Jesus and to a lesser extent the Buddha. They've tried very hard to keep that from happening in Buddha's case. And I wanted to say the reason I made that comment last Thursday night, which I think probably uh, infuriated most of the people in the audience about the, the Jesus of history versus the Christ of faith is that in fact people – some people have been working very hard to see if it wouldn't perhaps be possible to get Jesus out of all of that mythologization and see what he actually was as a person. Now it turns out to be fiendishly difficult in his case because we have this nasty habit of executing avatars and B because he was one of those who didn't write anything. Um, this is a movement incidentally that started in Germany in the late 19th, 13th, early 20th century. It's called Entmythologisierung, demythologization. And we're carrying it on today with very accurate historical tools. At first I thought that this was a big mistake but now I'm thinking that this could actually be a tremendous benefit. And incidentally that's why – I'm sure I'll get sued for this so let's all go down together <laughs> – that's why Mel Gibson did that movie of his which could be called Vida Mythologisierung, a re-mythologization taking the most negative, most violent parts of that religion and putting them up on a pedestal. And then it's been followed by some imitators since then. It's a desperate attempt to re-mythologize Jesus which I hope will totally fail. Yeah, Matthias. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's hard to say how he. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I mean in the last analysis, we know nothing about what he said or taught. But one of the things that seems to be somewhat trustworthy is when he would repeatedly say to people, you know, they would say, oh, you cured me and, and he said, your faith cured you. You know, I was a mirror that enabled you to see that faith. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> um, to get – not exactly back to the subject but, <laughs> you know, within – within range of the subject, I was going on about how much I like this set of terms and that I like it because we made it up this time and it's a mysterious process. Nobody knows how you get language into the mainstream or images into the mainstream. But we do know some things about it and I, I'm happy to say 
they, with my little nonprofit as a staff of two and the volunteers, all of whom are in this room, <laughs> that uh, we have the services of a world-class marketing person. And this has been really an exciting adventure where she's getting us to come back, condense everything into three words and, and so forth. Um, so we're, we now know, I think, how important it is to get control of the discourse and not have our opponents tell us who we are. And even within the nonviolence community, I've been saying all along that most of the people who belong to what I call strategic nonviolence, they, in their own terms, they define us as moral, which is a term that I basically never use because I perhaps have no right to, but <laughs> because I think it's kind of misleading. So let's just compare this, just to stick with this idea for one second. If this is what we have in the criminal justice area, if you go and look at what we have in the environmental area, we have this term called sustainability. And, you know, it's, it's, it's useful up to a point. I have a, a friend who has a, a law degree and a PhD in environmental science. And he, he, uh, he did a song, kind of a karaoke thing with a friend of his which went, unsustainable, that's what we are. <laughs> and it's a very, very funny song. But the point I want to make is that sustainable – Somehow this gets back to your point, Sarah, that it, it's like taking something that we've already got and freezing it, and that somehow doesn't do it for me. If you look here, to take another example. In the early years of the perpetual peace movement in Europe, the idea of perpetual peace mostly was that you take a contractual – arrangement of non-conflict between two states and freeze it. And that would not work. And one of the very few people in this tradition who saw that this was not enough was Immanuel Kant. He wrote a book, a uh, little essay called Zum Ewigen Frieden on perpetual peace. But he said, no, it has to be rooted much more deeply and organically and so forth. But first of all, a contractual non-conflict state is not peace. So you don't even have the energy there to work with. And second of all, it's a pipe dream to think that by getting people to sign on to the thing, it will stay there because they've signed it. The average, during the Cold War, there was a study done of the average life of an arms treaty. And I think it was two to two and a half years. It was about as long as they – that was before the present regime was, got itself into power in Florida in the year 2000. <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, su sustainable sounds a little bit too much like the mistake that was also made in the 80s in the anti-nuclear age when our great rallying cry was survival. It's not enough. Do I want to survive? Yeah, but it's not the kind of thing that's going to rouse my most creative energies. And it was pointed out about – two-thirds of the way through that decade that if we have a nuclear war, cockroaches will survive. They, they turn out to be very resistant to radiation. So have this whole planet of cockroaches is like a science fiction fantasy. And I'm, I'm sure they would divide themselves into north cockroaches and south cockroaches and <laughs> rebuild the whole thing. But the point that I'm making here is – again, these are kind of Manichaean terms. You see what I mean? That they're staying in the – realm of the non-creative and the negative. And then we come finally, if we wanted to look at animal world, we talk about animal rights. And it's a similar problem but a little bit different. And I noticed that in Dwinell Hall, if you walk and look at the display cases in Dwinell Hall, there's one called uh, Animal Advocacy. Student Council of Animal Advocacy. Makes a little bit more sense. But it's been pointed out not just by me but people who agree with me, <laughs> obviously on the right side things, that the term rights is a bit abstract. And there's a point at which 
uh, feminists are quite correct in this. We need to reground this in concrete living realities. And in fact, right at the end of World War II when the uh, UN came up with a Declaration of Human Rights, they thought, oh, Mahatma Gandhi is going to be our man. We'll get him to sign this thing right away. They went to him and he said, come back when you've got a Declaration of Human Responsibilities and I'll be happy to sign it. He did not like the idea of rights because these tend to be things that you claim for yourself. Yes, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The, there's a philosopher, and if, if you've read this section in my book, you'll be very well aware of this, named Mary Midgley. And she is a passionate advocate of animals. What should we say? Animal non suffering <laughs> and animal empathy. Our empathy with animals. And she said, we're going to have to ditch the term rights. It doesn't work as a philosopher. It hasn't got enough substantiality to it. Close the door carefully, Shannon. Thank you. So uh, this is one of the big pluses, uh, several of the big pluses actually of restorative justice. It goes really right to the heart of things in a stealth way, which sometimes is necessary. We got to make up our own vocabulary, which is very, very helpful, and we should do that more often, figure out how to get our words out into the mainstream discourse. As I mentioned last time – hang on one second, Marisa. As I mentioned last time, it is a very good example of globalization from below in the sense that we're drawing upon indigenous ways, indigenous mechanisms that have worked and using them in the context of our own cultures. Um, I was in the city of Atlanta a number of years ago and the four young white guys had burned down a black church and they were apprehended and they were sentenced to rebuild the church. And that was, was a very good example. And this is something that we could learn from the Navajo in this, in this case. That's so that was one good thing about it. And then we have this variety of restorative projects going on which could be used to build out to a whole constructive culture. And that's one of the things I'd really like to look at is, you know, what are all the projects that are going on and what pieces do they plug in in the puzzle and how could we get them all on one page? And you have things like the victim offender reconciliation programs. Uh, I think we did talk about those a little bit. And also some preventative programs where you apply education and other things like that, you know, before people get involved in gangs. On Saturday in San Diego, I'll be talking to a man who lost his 26-year-old son to a ridiculous random act of gang-related violence. And, and he turned his whole life around, gave up a highly, highly successful, financially successful career and now dedicated himself to keeping children and youth out of gangs. And he's now spoken to more than three million school children. There's also a fellow again in San Diego. I don't know why San Diego is so ahead of the curve in this. I think uh, even though I am an honorary citizen of San Diego, it's this, this, uh, I feel somehow more of an affiliation with Berkeley. Anyway, he uh, – there's another person who is an American-born Buddhist fellow in a Thai lineage who's been taking South Asian youth and not just keeping them out of gangs but getting them to take vows and ordination and wearing robes and the whole thing. And guess what? When they do that in their community, they get a tremendous amount of respect. And guess what? It turns out that if there's one thing that drives people to crime, it's disrespect. And that's not just me speaking. Though if it were, of course, it would be enough. But <laughs> uh, psychiatrists, a um, uh, couple, three of them. Incidentally, Philip Zimbardo, who did some very important studies, he was here yesterday. So please go and see him. <laughs> his, his wife is the head of the academic senate and his daughter was a PAX major. So he's definitely a good guy even though he worked at Stanford. But what I was saying is like the, one of the most common terms 
in the gang world is dis. He dissed me. And this particular psychiatrist I'm thinking of who has dealt with the most dangerous repeat violent offenders, he said one of the things that he commonly hears from them is, I never got so much respect as when I shoved my gun in that dude's face. It's all about – I mean, here I am generalizing again. I know I'm generalizing. Whatever is the penalty, I will pay it cheerfully. <laughs> uh, but if one had to generalize, the s at least if it's not the only cause, it's the single most effective way that we could get at crime prevention would be to get people some respect. Can we stop? Uh -huh. I realize how profound it is that a healthy crime is not one that is sustainable but regenerative. Oh, wow. And so, you know, it's like it's like that word that really is sustainable. Imagine regenerative farming. <laughs> I love it. Because think, uh, <laughs> you don't, you don't like freeze a seed. Indefinitely, it only does – and Jesus actually said this – it only is going to do any good if it dies and rolls over into the next incarnation. Right. Yeah, and actually in terms of American farming, which I'm a little bit close to on one edge because we have a very – for our little community, we have a very productive organic gardener and the, the guy who lives in our community happens to be on the organic gar farm board. Bureau for Marin County. Um, it's it's interesting that farmers are partly on board with organic farming because partly they have a sense that this would work very well, but partly they're suffering because they are marginal. Farm most farming, and except for agribusiness, is marginal, and you cannot afford to do something that's going to take away your tiny little margin. So to do – to convert to organic farming r involves economic risks in the short term. But mo I would say that if you took like a group of farmers and a group of non-farmers, on the whole, farmers would be more aware of and in favor of regenerative farming and sustainability and uh, organic growth. Yeah, I know a friend of mine lived in a community so somewhere in the Midwest and there was a time when the government was giving out various kinds of ridiculous subsidies. And so they sent this community many, many blocks of Velveeta cheese in plastic wrappers. <laughs> and so here they are these, you know, vegan <laughs> animal rights people looking at this saran wrap food and they said, what are we going to do with this? So they took their tractor out and dug a deep hole and buried all of this stuff. And it, it was a sustainable community and some 10 or 12 years later they were plowing and they dug into this stuff and guess what? It had not changed a hair. It looked exactly the way it did when they buried it in the ground 12 years earlier. So that's probably what would do in your GI tract too. It would not go through any kind of a regeneration <laughs> process. All right. Um, yes, Ashley. Um, a yeah. Uh, Whoa. Well. Uh huh. Yeah. For their individual lifestyle yeah. because Yeah. It's a real problem for those people and it's a pity because it would be so easy to solve. And I think the way to solve it would be two ways. The, there should be some government subsidies. I do believe in government and that it should subsidize certain things. And on the other hand, we as consumers – a friend of mine pointed this out to me a long time ago and I hated it, but it's true. 
we have to be willing to pay for what we want. We have to be willing to pay the whole value. Now, there is a dairy farm down the road a piece from us, uh, Strauss Dairy. It was started by Holocaust survivors in West Marin. And it's the first organic dairy uh, at least west of the Mississippi. There's a lot of turf <laughs> west of the Mississippi. Um, and they are – what that means is that if, if a cow gets sick, they have to get rid of that cow because they can't put in antibiotics. Uh, they have to be very careful about feed. They, they, they all have electric vehicles, so they can't go more than 60 miles <laughs> at one shot. But the fact is they're doing fine. Uh, you know, I, we have a very fine French bakery in our little town, and so naturally it, because of my Swadeshi, I have to go there to have almond croissants every Saturday and hang out with uh, the local farmers. And you know, there's Albert and, and his wife every weekend, and they're doing well. They'd, they had to branch out into doing organic ice cream and things like that. It was very good, you know, Strauss ice cream. But it is possible to do, and it would not be difficult with just a little bit of sacrifice on our part and a little bit of effort and intelligence. Maybe that's the missing piece here. A little bit of intelligence on the part of the government. We would be able to convert to – what, what are we going to say? Regenerative, closer to reality farming. Yeah, yeah John? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Okay, you're making an excellent point. Uh, John's making an excellent point here that that was actually Gandhi's way into all of this because I wanted to say a long time ago, so let me say it now. Gandhi did not straight out say a whole much about the environment or farming, and one of the reasons was it was second nature for him. He, you know, there was no. When, for example, when my teacher, uh, Sri Ishran, when he first heard of organic food, he said, organic food? What is that? Are people supposed to eat plastic? All food is organic. You know, he, what he didn't realize what we were talking about was highly processed versus not so highly processed. But in his farm in Kerala, South India, where Zoe might be going on spring break, they didn't even use fertilizer from cows on somebody else's field. It, w it was so Swadeshi, so self-sustaining, self-sufficient, uh, so self-contained and regenerative. Uh, and the pr so the point that John was making is that this is going to be closely connected with kind treatment of animals, non-exploitive economic systems, localism. All of this is going to – if you ho get a hold of one – really basic thing and cling to it. If you do satyagraha with it, the law of progression, you'll see it's spilling out into all other dimensions of regeneration that we need to talk about. Okay, good. I want – so what I'd like to do um, – always ready to be trumped by your questions, but uh, left to my own devices, what I would do in the next 15 minutes. I want to say just a little bit about the animal rights movement and then talk about major environmental struggles in India and at least tell you the name of the movement that I was going to talk about at some length, which is the Chipko movement. Uh, the, I guess we've said a number of things about the animal advocacy movement, which I, which I think were very well said. And I, I have to say that for some funny reason, and it's an interesting reason, we should, we should talk about it. For some reason, the animal rights – whatever you want to call it – movement the, has been the least nonviolent in terms of approach. And I'm sure you've all noticed this. And this manifests itself in a variety of ways. One is when these organizations come to do an exhibit on campus, it's going to be like Botrero. <laughs> it's going to be like Abu Ghraib. Here's this horrible panoply of animals being tortured and you're guilty and so forth. Uh, the amount, the level of anger in this movement – because I'm generalizing, there are exceptions – but the level of anger has been appalling. Now, I happen to be – 
a person for whom some of my best friends are animals. <laughs> in fact, in a sense, all of my friends are <laughs> animals. But uh, uh, I feel very deeply, relatively speaking, with the suffering of animals. I just have been trained that way. And I have often wanted to cooperate with groups that advocate this. And I have rarely, if ever, been enabled to because they come on like gangbusters, like, you know, let's trash the lab, let's do this, that, and the other thing. And uh, I was in a project once. In fact, I s started a project at Berkeley here on campus to save a colony of monkeys who had been the subjects of studies by the anthropology department. I mean, thank God for – thank Hanuman that they were anthropology monkeys and not physiology <laughs> monkeys because that, that's a little bit rougher. But the, the anthropologists were just observing them and then – so, okay, it was a violation of their privacy, but it <laughs> wasn't much more serious. And then uh, they ran out of grant money. They couldn't keep the animals anymore, so their first thought is, well, we will have to destroy them. But s they didn't act on it right away, so it leaked out. And again, there's Ishwaran got a hold of this. He said, Michael, you have to fix this. I said, yes, sir. Went down to campus, got together with a bunch of friends, had a very good campaign going. And there was one person who almost torpedoed the campaign. He said, we really want to shaft the university on this one. And he's going to have these hate letters all ready to go. And now we're going to get him. And I said, look, I – I have my problems with this university, don't get me wrong. You know, like any red-blooded American, I don't like bureaucracies any more than you do. But I tell you what, I said, why don't we save the monkeys this time and get the university on the next one? But he wouldn't go along with it. We have to get the university right now. And eventually we had to write a letter to the chancellor saying, hey, don't confuse us with him. <laughs> and he was the main animal advocate in the East Bay. He was the head of one of the main animal advocacy groups. And so I'm asking myself, why here's this project, this value, which is inherently so nonviolent, why is this of all the sectors in the whole nonviolent movement, as far as I am aware, why is it the least nonviolent in attitude? And the only thing I could come up with and tell me if you think this makes sense to you or if there might be some other reason. The only thing I can come up with is that somehow <coughs> when, the, when the creature being hurt is helpless, it triggers something in us which is deeper even than it is, say, in the case of another human group. I mean, it's like children and animals being hurt. It infuriates us more than when it's human against human. Even though there are you know, heavily armed humans against not so heavily armed humans. That's the only reason I can think of why this movement in particular has been so hampered by that kind of anger and ad hominem, recriminatory, vengeful approach. I went to a meeting in North Carolina one time. It was about animal rights and I, I, I s told them what I just told you as well as some other things that were less offensive. And I think it went over pretty well. I think the only group who was really, really angry at me was the Italians. And I don't know why but they just – I don't know, maybe somehow <laughs> that's how they approach things anyway. And they're really not that angry when you stop to talk to them. Um, Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, did you have a question, Ashley? Yeah. Um, if you don't have time, don't worry. There's always time for questions. Okay, it was just that um, the difference in temptation when you look at, you know, like the um, helplessness of humans when comparing to animals, the difference in those, like that kind of violence to attack people again, like in, for instance, in the genocide or when Russians do something at a yeah. Yeah. It's not that it's it, it involves in this um mobilization of people wanting to attack violently mm -hmm. rather than necessarily they sympathize. Yeah. But. That's right. Uh, even this question of child soldiers, which I think is probably the most painful blot against humanity that's that's happened, um somehow 
it doesn't provoke that utter negative, counter-effective hatred the way it does in the animal flesh world. It's a, f it's a funny thing. Arby? Uh -huh. People in general are against violence. Like people don't want genocide to continue. But it's I think the idea of um, like because animal when it comes to animal rights, it's you have to change a lot of things in the culture. And I think there's a big stigma around it. Is mm -hmm. that like contributes to why so Yeah, I, yeah I, I think yeah there is a stigma attached to it, and I think you know that's an interesting point. After all is said and done. If you didn't kill animals, you would not be able to eat them, right? <laughs> because run around, you know, despite that song, Oleana, Oleana. You couldn't run around eating little roasted piggies. Uh, you have to kill them first. So if you're against killing, you're going to have to change your food habits. And there's a funny thing about food habits. They're a code. It's very, very deep. When uh, classical scholars, for example, have studied food codes in the ancient Greek world, and they've shown that there are four basic schools of philosophy in the Hellenistic period in Athens, and each one was connected with a certain dietary pattern. So it is, it's that I think that's also a very good point. If people immediately feel threatened, okay, they could give up their fur coats, though I don't think that PETA goes about doing this very well. You know, they have a, a a slogan, I'd rather go naked than wear furs. That to me, that's a little bit confusing. But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, okay, people could give that up. And now that we've got rayon, we don't need animal furs anymore. But somehow that food habit, it, it, you have to let people grow into this. And I'm thinking of now an episode when Gandhi went to Bihar. So we're talking 1917. Uh, there he, a lot of volunteers collected, you know, thousands. We want to work with you. And whenever this happens in India, whenever you get thousands of people who pull together, not because they're members of a community, but because they're interested in an issue, you'll have a thing. Some of us are vegetarians, some of us not. What are we going to do? So the vegetarians are saying, hey, no non vegetarian food here. It's a clean movement. Uh, they're going to have to eat zucchini. But it was Gandhi who said, let them have their kitchen and we'll have ours. And guess what? Within one week, the non-vegetarians had closed down their kitchen and come over and said, can we eat with you guys? Because A, vegetarian food's a lot better. <laughs> if you don't believe me, just order a vegetarian meal next time you're on United <laughs> Airlines. All your fellow passengers will say, hey, what's that? Um, but B, I think it's because that's the only way it can go. You know, you can't ask vegetarians not to be vegetarians, but you can ask non-vegetarians to temporarily eat vegetarian. That way you get the community back together. <laughs> well, once again, I feel very good about what we have said. I feel a slight pang of regret <laughs> about what we have not said. Let me just give a piece of it, and that is to say that in India today, there are major struggles going on and they are tending to not be in the area of militarism, but they are tending to be in the area of environmental protection. And they tend to be directed at the federal government, you know, the GOI, Government of India, but with full awareness that the government of India in this respect is really not a government of India anymore. It's a government of multinational corporations being used by them. And I think you could kind of make a list of four or five really basic environmental areas where these struggles are going on at a really acute level with some significant successes. One, the first, historically speaking, was against uh, clear-cutting, logging, and that's where our Chipko movement would have come in if I had gotten to it. I'll figure out a way of making us more familiar with it. 
Um, the second is against dams. So the, to go by organization, this group here is the Chipko Andalan. Andalan means movement. A Chipko means hugging. So this is the hugging movement. Now it's not what you're thinking. <laughs> this is not like a flower child hugging movement taking place in Golden Gate Park. This is women hugging trees to prevent them from being felled by axe-wielding corporate operatives. Another organization is the Narmada Bachao Andalan. which means save the Narmada movement. Uh, the Na Narmada is an extensive river system that starts in sort of the central Gangetic Plain and flows west to enter the sea near Gandhi's hometown of Porbandar. So it flows mostly through uh, – starts in Madhya Pradesh, I think, any, some of the tributaries and ends up in Gujarat. The government of India, in as part of its modernization program, I guess I have to back up here one slight little step. There is a, an excellent documentary made by the BBC, interestingly enough, called Gandhi's India. And it talks about the fact that Gandhi's economic ideas were completely reversed by the – independent governments of India, the Nehru government. They just said, this absolutely will not work. We cannot have village uplift, decentralization, Swadeshi, none of that. We need industrialization and we need it fast. And, you know, and it was hard for – it would be hard to argue with that. You had millions, millions of people starving. You can't wait for those two years that you were talking about, Ashley, for the system to rebound. But anyway, they went too far, way too far, and completely rejected everything that Gandhi had stood for. And by the – Late 50s, Indians were beginning to realize that this is not working for our country. And they're trying to rediscover simple, simple economics, natural ac economics. And by this time, the government had put in the most – probably the most ambitious dam building project in the world. Maybe second to the Three Gorges project in China, but uh, after those two, probably the biggest in the world. And what happens when you build these dams? Well, uh, you know perfectly well what happens. If you, you have the huge lakes where you used to have forests. Uh, you have dramatic, drastic shifts in water availability. And the government was claiming that whenever villagers would be driven out of their land, they would be resettled. And they had a very ambitious resettlement project for them and it was very intelligent. And the electrical power and the water – would be made available to farmers. Well, people like Arundhati Roy and others uh, used their intellectual prowess to show that you still had people living in refugee camps in utter squalor after 10 years and somehow all the money that was designated to put them into nice little model villages, even if that were an acceptable solution, which it is not. You know, you wrench people out of their village where their families have been living for a thousand years and say, now we'll give you a nice concrete Quonset hut to live in? I'm afraid not. So even at best, it wouldn't have been very good, but it was not at best by any means. They were just living like refugees. And secondly, guess what? All that water and all that electrical power was going to the coal companies and the big power firms downstream from these villages. So. There's been a big resistance movement to the dams. And parts of this movement have been third stage satyagraha, meaning people, villagers, sometimes individuals. You only need one really to make this work. But sometimes in large numbers have said, I refuse to leave my village. If you flood it, I will drown. And they have actually stopped the government from doing that. And I have a friend who when the American River was going to be dammed uh, somewhere north of Sacramento, he – well, who is? Auburn. At Auburn. Right. That's right. You remember that. I mean. He, my friend, uh, went up there and 
chained himself to a rock up to his chest in the water and sent a telegram to the authorities in Sacramento saying, I am chained to this river in an undisclosed location and if you build that dam, I will drown. And in those days, they didn't have the kind of super spy equipment that they have today. They couldn't find him and they had to postpone. I th did the Auburn Dam have an entrance? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, the, our <laughs> <laughs> yes, evil exists as long as you support it. But <laughs> you keep re you keep reelecting it, you're going to have to keep fighting it. Okay, let me quickly mention that there are a couple of other areas, three in particular: seed, genetic seed modification, which has been horrendous, uh, turning, changing people's economies into commercially exportable, particularly shrimp fisheries, for example. And thirdly and finally, Coca-Cola, which has been one of the most conspicuous cons successes. They bring in a Coca-Cola plant. P notice the word plant, ha, ha, ha. People have been drinking coconut water for 10,000, 20,000 years in this village. It goes fine, thank you. We replant the coconut trees, no problem. And suddenly they come in and say, no, you don't want to drink water or coconut milk. You want Coke, don't you? We have a big billboard at the entrance to your village that's telling you this. And it turns out that in order to manufacture Coca-Cola, among other deficits, you have to extract vast, unthinkable vast quantities of groundwater to do it. And a group called the Sarvodaya Mandal, which means uh, – Sarvodaya means the uplift of all, Sarvodaya. And mandal means circle in the sense of network organization, which is a direct – as I would say here and here, you had direct descendants of Gandhi. I'll forget a little time. I'll talk about that in greater detail. Sarvodaya was the Gandhian concept and it's a Gandhi-inspired organization. And I have an interview with uh, one of the heads of this on videotape that I'll try and use for you. But they have, using purely nonviolent methods, they have stopped Coca-Cola from expanding or continuing to function in a number of locations. Thank you for listening to the express train here today. And uh, 